Welcome back to that rugby podcast. Good day, good day. Husey, how are we? It was a, uh, it was a weekend. It was a weekend. We can say yeah, that. Yeah, uh, certainly was. Starting on the Friday. Yeah. A lot of footy. A lot of footy. It's great. It's back. Super Rugby is back. The Premier Rugby Competition. <laughs> you are saying, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, <laughs> Premier Rugby Competition in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, that's uh, occurring currently. Um, and you and I actually went to a game. We went to the Waratahs and the Brumbies. Uh, a great game to uh, a great game to watch to kick off the season. Um, even though the Tars lost, and uh, we also recorded a video there. We interviewed some Waratahs and Brumbies fans and one random South fan uh, <laughs> out the front of Allianz Stadium for the game. The uh, that video is up on our YouTube page and links on all our social medias and everything like that. So you people know where to see that video. Um, and it's uh, it's also it wasn't just a video interviewing the fans. It was a warning. It was a shot fired across the bow- bows of the established <laughs> rugby media that the sports booth is here. We are, will be taking over Stan Sport, Fox Sport. What's We're up? here. We are here. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm thinking next time we might just pitch a couple of tents out the front there um, yeah. and, and set a base. And yeah. we will yeah. be forever known as the Waratah fan interviewers, at least. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then look, who well, are they I, facing? Yeah, look, I want to say as well, thank you to the people that agreed to be uh, interviewed and even to those that declined. Um, you know, thanks. For, everyone was really polite. And the people that we did chat to, everyone was actually – Really interesting to talk to, um, young and old, male, female, Waratahs or Brumbies. Uh, really great um, chatting to some of the fans there. Uh, a lot of excitement about this upcoming rugby season. That's what we'd like to hear. Um, but I imagine we'll be talking about that game a little bit uh, later as well. But for now, uh, after you finish listening to and watching this podcast, go and watch that YouTube video if you already haven't. <laughs> yes, I mean... Yeah, it was it was fun to get down there and watch some footy. Footy back in the summer hemisphere is fantastic, yeah. and when it's full fifteens and not sevens, it, yeah. it does it does make it exciting. And, and you know what, people, you know what was great about the game? Tickets were like thirty five bucks. That's cr- yeah. that's a great value. That's yeah, a night out for thirty five bucks. That's pretty good. And, and even though this was general admission seating, still pretty good seating at the you know behind the post, but you could see everything. At the New Orleans as well. It's yeah. a it's a bloody good place. Um, let's let's get into into I guess our Super Rugby chat now. Uh, yeah. The way we I've structured this is I've got my three best things from the week. Husey's got his three best things. Then we've got a worst best a worst thing from the week as well from the Super Rugby week specifically. Our best you know, worst thing. Our best worst thing. Our um, top worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we want to share more positives than negatives on this on yeah, this podcast, obviously. 100%. But I'm going to start off with my best three things. Now, uh, I'm going to start off with my point one, which is actually points. Now, we're going to discuss it a little bit later, which is the, the new rules. But I calculated in this round of rugby, it was scored a total of 368 points at an average of 61.3 recurring per game, which meaning that, you know, and if you half that, so each team scored on average 30.67 recurring points, which I, yeah. you know, that's a fantastic game. And what it said to yep. me is you're going to have to score at least 30 points to win a game. And the only team mm-hmm. who didn't score 30, or who scored 30 points and didn't win was Moana Pacifica in a 34-36 tussle against the Dura. So, to me, I, I think the Waratahs as well, right? Waratahs thirty-one to thirty-four, wasn't it? No, twenty-five, bro. You win. Was it twenty-five? Thirty-one. Yeah, 25. I was twenty-five. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I got thirty-one, thirty-four from, but yeah, there you go. The fact that 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 was the game. You could have told me any other game. You could have chosen any other game, and I would have had to slightly think. But the fact the game that we went and watched, you don't even know. It the was score. so many points. I was just I was lost <laughs> in the crowd atmosphere. I wasn't keeping track of points. I just knew who was ahead, is it, who is was that behind. You were losing? That was is it. that why? Is that why you? No, weren't no. Actually, it, genuinely, because we were ahead at different points, it was it was genuinely <laughs> like a, a very thrilling game to watch. Yeah, this is this is what Husey will say. He'll yeah, it was thrilling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the Waratahs were losing, and he didn't really keep track. He was just too busy. His eyes were were fixated on two players, and it was Charlie well, Gamble, well, and then one that I'll let Husey talk a bit more later because yeah. he may be the next, 
I guess, Love and Hughes's life, as I have Peter Larkai in mine. Um, so that was my number one. I, I love that we're seeing points. We're seeing big games. Yes. Um, ideally, you don't want them to be blowouts. And as I saw it, only two blowouts in the Blues smashing the uh, Highlanders and the Hurricanes beating the Reds. You know, you had yep. the Rebels and the Force 34-27. You had your um, Waratahs 25. You know, like there was yeah. some really good games. Um, what a comeback by the Force in that one as well. Uh, I don't want to. We'll talk about that later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> second, second point, 25,076. Now, you're probably thinking, what's that number? That is the well, number that I know intended. what the number is. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't you who I was questioning. It was the rest yeah. of our audience. Thank you, Husey. Uh, okay. 25,076 is the number that came and witnessed the Waratahs versus the Brumbies. Now, again, I think Allianz can hold just over 40,000. I believe it's like 42. So it would have been great to probably get another 5,000 in there, maybe yeah. push, t- push it up to 10, and I think Eddie would have been happy. But I thought... From where you were two years ago, where I watched the SCG, and there was maybe four thousand people who came and watched the well, Hurricanes and Tars. That's what I'm. I'm just going to see if I can look up now. What the if we have the crowd for the Dura and the Waratahs last year? Because yeah. it was definitely not twenty five thousand. It was I a lot said less than it. maybe eight at that yeah. one, and I would have said the SCG one I went to in twenty twenty one. Would have been I, I would have said five or six in the SCG, which is a mm. is a miserable stadium for six thousand people to be in when it's only six thousand. So, just the improvements, and I know it's the local derby, and the Waratahs obviously have come from a winless season to a winning season, and now on to to this season where mm. obviously you're hoping for the best of success. I just thought it was a it was a good start. I I five thousand more, ten thousand more, and you got people really talking. Like if I was a leaguey. I would have said, you know, you got Eddie Jones back. There was all this talk about, you know, we had all these issues with the CBA and you only mustered up 25, you know, just over, well, let's say 60% of capacity. As a league, again, and they have their own issues with getting crowds in. I'm not trying to pit sides against sides, but I wouldn't yeah. have been, like, shaking in my boots from 25,000. 35,000, I would have been like, that's a pretty bloody good turnout for the first game yeah. of the season. Yeah, look, and I think that's an uh, important thing to know is it's the first game of the season – uh, ex- there's expectations for the Waratahs, but they're not a winning team yet. They're not, they're not, you know, st- putting their stamp down as the top team, uh, which the Brumbies I think did. Uh, and I think those we 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 both picked them to be the top two Australian teams. I think they showed why uh, on the day. I think the Brumbies just showed a little bit more of their uh, experience in, in that game. Uh, Took the words right out of my mouth there. Took the yeah. words right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> and look, yeah. I, I, from, from a Waratahs fan perspective, 25,000, look, I'll take that, to be honest, based on some of the crowd numbers that we've been getting in the last couple of years. 25,000 is a good starting point, um, I'd like, and I'd like to see that momentum continue. I think the fact that it was at Allianz was a big plus, you know, rather than out at Parramatta in yeah. the comeback stadium, which it was last year. Uh, Allianz is now super easy to get to with the light rail and things like that. Like you you can't underestimate the importance of people actually getting to the game, right? If it's a, if it's a bloody hassle to get to the game, people aren't going to go like it is out in Homebush, right? You need that public transport. You need the, or if you're going to have parking, you need to have it cheap, right? Which of course stadium does not have cheap parking. And it's, that's what you need to, that's what, you know, maybe that's what rugby AU needs to be subsidizing is parking or something like that or public transport. I know for a few big sporting events, there's free public transport occasionally, or there used to be anyway. Yeah, State Stuff of o, like I that. went to State of O yes, uh, last year and that was free. free exactly. Transport. Stuff like that is is what is needed to bring the, the crowds in. But I will take 25000 for the opening game of the season. Yeah, what I would say is there's, there's two things, that, and you've mentioned them really well there, is A, yeah, you need ease as is, is one of the – things that'll bring people in, or you need the experience. And, and that's what you built at Leichhardt last year. That's yep. why fans were coming, because fill the hill, it grew, you know, you're having a good season. And so that, so with the ease of Allianz, I like the idea of Allianz and, and that being, you know, the home stadium for the year. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, you can get even bigger crowds as you start to hopefully win some games. But I did want to say, yep. mention just quickly on that point as well. Yeah, I thought this was, you look at the Brumbies again, even last year, you were surprised over they were in games like this. Like you were expecting, like we we, we said, you know, they was, we were surprised they were favourites um, going into the game. But you were surprised when they were competitive in games like this, beating yeah. the Crusaders. You were like, what? The, what's happening? 
now it's kind of expected. Talk about the were, Waratahs, not the Brumbies. I think you should. Sorry, yes, yeah, the Waratahs. Yes, yes. Um, now that they were in the game, it was like more you. When watching that game, it was the Waratahs lost that game rather than we're just happy to be in it. If you know what I mean. Yeah. If you're picking up what I'm dribbling. Um, I think I yeah. I, I definitely think yeah. It was a step up again for the Waratahs. But moving on to my final point, and. Obviously, it doesn't happen often, um, and it especially doesn't happen at a home venue often. But the Crusaders losing to the Chiefs. Now, I'm not a big Chiefs supporter because um, I think people overrate them, but I am, I criminally underrate them if, if I would go the other way. I yep. go to the point where I go, oh, the Chiefs aren't going to do anything. Then the Chiefs pull out performances like that. Now, going in at halftime, I thought Crusaders are going to run away with this game. That second half from the Chiefs, good Lord Almighty, I don't know what what came about them, but if they keep that up all season, Chiefs are a team to watch. Uh, look, I couldn't have said it better myself, and in fact, I tried not to replicate <laughs> any of your three best things, um, but I couldn't go past that one. It's always good. And this is one thing that both that unites Australia and New Zealand, all Anzacs uh, out there, is the Crusaders losing is always, always a good thing. So... Um, I'll take that. That's one of my three. That was my third of my three best things. But my other two, look, you alluded to it earlier. Uh, my first best thing, and getting to see it live in person as well, is Maxie J, Max Jorgensen, the 18-year-old wonderkind for the Waratahs, <laughs> out on the wing, playing sort of out of position, although he did shift into fullback uh, towards the end of the game. Uh, a great run by him. Two tries on debut, uh, you know, one of which... Uh, his first try was the most impressive to me, uh, and and you said it on the night as well that the the two tacklers he beat to score that try under the post was Alan Alatoa uh, and Rob Valentini, two established Wallabies. And as what was also really impressive with, for that was for an 18 year old kid, he was right in position in the middle of the field, even though he was playing wing at the time. He knew where he needed to be to support his teammates. He was in position. There's something that Australian rugby has been lacking a little bit. That's something that. Zealand rugby is very good at that support play, backing up off of an offload. Uh, uh, and so that, I'm going to talk about a negative side to that in a little bit for my worst thing. But that is my first best thing is Max Jorgensen. Yeah, let's my give second... Maxie, Maxie just a round of applause because that was for an 18-year-old to step up like that. I, yeah. I was, I think... You just can't not be a little bit impressed. Like, yep. um, and that was the reason he went into my team of the week. Him and uh, Corey O'Toole or Corey Tool, uh, yes. had a had a fantastic game as well. But yeah. and I know it was, was his first was game superb. coming from sevens. But I just yep. thought an eighteen year old stepping onto that field for the first time debut in a big game against that and playing the way he did. I just thought you, you can't leave him out of a team of the week. Yeah, Corey Tool was uh, incredible, and they really the Brumbies really planned around his speed very well. Definitely. Um, and uh, look, is well you take you look at that game. The Brumbies got a try where it was a, a penalty, and everyone was standing there talking to the referee. They took a quick tap and kicked it to the wing to uh, their other winger, whose name I forget. Uh, and you're ahead. You ahead, and they they got a free try there basically. And look, that's clever. Can't take that away from them, but it just shows how tight that game was. Um, yep. And so, big respect to both teams. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Tool on the other wing for the Brumbies, I thought, uh, played very, very well. More than earned his spot uh, in the Brumbies starting lineup. And another thing the Brumbies did, which I thought was interesting, was they uh, had Nick White and Lola Seo on the bench to come on uh, towards the back end of the game to finish the game off. And I thought that was a very interesting way to uh, handle their, their spine. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it worked out for them. You know, they were definitely the more composed of the two teams in the final 10, 15 minutes. And that's really uh, when the game was fully iced. Um, moving on to my next best thing. Uh, look, you talked about the Waratahs and one of your best things. It's only fair that I return the favor and talk about the Hurricanes. The yeah. Hurricanes. Look, we we said that the, uh, the Reds were probably going to struggle a little bit this year. Uh, and they faced a big test in the first game against the Hurricanes. Um, now, I think we both probably expected the Hurricanes to win this game, but I don't think we saw quite the performance that that came from the Hurricanes. Well, of course you did. I didn't, though. I didn't <laughs> see that coming from the Hurricanes. Mate, you and predicted look, them to win the comp. You, exactly. You, you've seen this from a mile away. You saw this from a mile away. You saw this before yeah. I even I saw it. I, yeah. I was confident. I was confident in a Reds 
you know, demise, but you were confident in a Hurricanes victory. Exactly. And that's I that's my that's why it's my second best thing. It's a bit of validation for me picking <laughs> the Hurricanes. And that, along with the Crusaders losing in round one, is a uh, big step forward for my bold prediction of the Hurricanes topping Super Rugby this year. Uh, so congrats to the Hurricanes. And then my third best thing, as I mentioned, Crusaders losing. Can't go past them. Can't go past them. Crusaders losing at home, in fact. Um, and I might jump in with my worst thing before you here because, in, because I talked earlier when I was talking about uh, Maxi J about uh, the offloads and being a position, and that was great. But what I saw from the Waratahs and what I saw from a few other teams as well, um, particularly Australian teams, is ball handling. It's the Achilles heel. I hate saying it that way, but that's how Australians say it. The Achilles heel <laughs> of Australian rugby teams. It's the Achilles heel. Hey, uh, please learn your classical Greek. It's the Achilles heel of Australian rugby where <sighs> New Zealand rugby has got a great free-flowing aspect to it when there's broken play and people are there in support and there's sick offloads and people are catching the ball and they're making huge meters of scoring tries. Right? Australian rugby is, tries to replicate that, but... Uh, occasionally, there are, there are times when you just need to take a hit and just need to take a tackle, and there are times when you should offload. And I saw a bit too much offloading for my liking with players that were clearly not prepared to receive the ball or just poorly thrown offloads. And it yep. is it is just crippling for Australian rugby where you get a bit of ball movement going and then you turn the ball over. And the Waratahs uh, were guilty of it. The Brumbies were guilty of it a lot as well. There were a lot of balls popped loose in that game by good tackles, but very loose carries. Um, and there's, there's a few occasions where players were just trying to do a little bit too much um, and other players weren't prepared for it. So either one of those sliding scales needs to be adjusted. Either everyone needs to ha have much better reflexes and be prepared for the ball at all times. Even when you think your uh, fellow player is being tackled, still have your hands up, still be ready for the ball. Or people need to just take, take a hit a little bit more. Uh, and look, it, it can be a combination of both, but it's just not good enough it, at the moment, and it is what will cause uh, the downfall of the Wallabies come World Cup time. So that, so Eddie, Eddie Jones, <laughs> uh, listen in, get some coaching tips for you. I know you're still filling out your assistant coaching staff. Ball handling, priority number one. Well, yeah, I just saw. Did I see you just brought in Brett Hodgson? Yes, former he did. West Tiger. Um, yep. So I mean. I'm sure he's got some skills with the ball, um, so I'm sure he can help. But that was it was very noticeable in that Waratahs Brumby game. I guess the yeah the clinicalness of both teams, where an offload would hit the deck and just spill or something like that. My um, worst thing actually stems from the best one of my best things, which is yeah. I talked about how great it is seeing points, but it was really interesting seeing poor defense and very poor defense to that. Only one team kept 10 points or under. Only te two teams kept under 15 points. Uh, I searched two games. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the games are until after I sell it, but 63 missed tackles in one game and 62 missed tackles in another game. Now, one game was the Blues versus the Highlanders. Yeah. And the other game was the Dura versus Moana Pacifica, both the highest scoring games. Yes. But I just sat there and I went, there, I... I when I do my player of the weeks and the team of the weeks, I look for all the stats. I'm reading for all these stats. And they're just the column of missed tackles was higher than I've ever seen. I think I saw one player miss eight tackles. Uh, I won't name names, but I think they'll be having a video session if I've ever seen. Um, and it won't be a good one. Yeah. So I just think I'm really interested, and we'll t discuss this point later, if it's something to do with the new style and the new laws that those have – Cause the because the games are a bit more sped up. You're a bit more tired at any the games. You're missing tackles. Um, there, yeah. There's not so much opportunity for break. Everyone, like uh, quite a few coaches mentioned it. The the rebels coach, the force coach, Adi Savia mentioned it. The speed of the game. It's going to be you know who wants it more at the end of those games sometimes. Yeah. But defense, you know, as they say, defense wins championships. And so. If a team is willing and wanting to win a championship, someone's got to start with the defense. So that's why I sit yep. there and I go, when my power rankings release tomorrow, look for the Chiefs to be a top of it. Even though the Blues scored 60 points, what happened last year? The Chiefs will be a top of the power rankings. Purely, you hold a Crusaders team to 10 points. 
Um, I'm, I've got a lot of respect for the Chiefs after that. Yeah. But that was my worst point. I, I just kind of wanted to touch on a couple of key points from Super Rugby. We just touched on the Chiefs. I just want to touch on the Duda Moana Pacific game, a fantastic game of rugby. Yes. Right down to the wire. What I noticed from this in the preseason, the Duda had made quite a big statement with their games. They had, uh, I think they pushed the Reds. They had beaten the Force, beat the Rebels. Moana Pacifica, on the other hand, had been beaten quite soundly twice. And so I went into this game pretty confident the Duda will win. And the way that they were pushed by Moana Pacifica, I'm unable to tell if the Duda are as good as I think they are or Moana Pacifica isn't as bad as I thought they were. And yeah. so I'm going to be really interested. Obviously, Super Round this week, uh, you, Waratahs, play the Duda. How that's going to, like, you know, that game's going to go. How we get a feel for those two. I, I don't want to call them bottom teams because they're the newest teams in, in the competition. So two young yeah. teams, we'll call them. How they actually go. Because it was, it was great. I love putting them in round one. I think that's such a great matchup for round one. Yeah. But now comes the real business. Like, we're going to actually see how good the Dota are and how good Minor Pacific are. Yeah, well, uh, interestingly enough, Neither of the, I mean, it's only been one game, but they're they're actually in the top eight at the moment. <laughs> Both of those teams, <laughs> the Highlanders are officially the worst team at the moment, and the Crusaders are at ten. So love so that. Everyone's love seeing the Crusaders it, there. Screenshot it, yeah. tag us, put it on your story. Crusaders are bottom. We love that. Yeah. Um, next was the Blues. Obviously, an attacking masterclass by our Player of the Week this week, Mark Talia. Mm. Uh, it was special, but that whole back line has me scared now because like they are just so strong. There's so much depth there. There's so much talent. Mark Talia has a good game this week. Next week we'll be talking about Caleb Clark. The week after we'll be talking about Bowden Barrett. Then we've got to mention Rico Iwani, Roger Tuivasa, Sheik, and New All Black Stephen Pitafeta, not to mention AJ Lamb or Bryce Heem, Finlay Christie. I could go on and on. Like this team just attackingly must give teams nightmares. Like, you think Highlanders have had all preseason to prepare to play that Blues team. You know, that's that's what they've been sitting there and thinking about. Circled on the and calendar, the, yeah. And the Blues put 60 on them. 60 points is a lot of points. Like, I, I don't, like that is that takes me back. Like, that is 60 points. That takes me back to when I think the Hurricanes beat the Rebels 71-9 on some disastrous day for the Rebels. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I just thought the Blues looking fantastic. Last two teams and points I want to talk about here are two teams that I've made pretty bold statements about. Now, the Reds are the first one. I said they were going to come 11th. You were validated in your pick of the Hurricanes. I was validated in the Queensland Reds hosting the Hurricanes in Townsville where they would have been wanting to make a statement. Yeah. Eddie Jones, new Aussie coach in the crowd, and they put up that. They put up that. It's... Abysmal, if you ask me. Yep. And this is what I saw coming. It wasn't, I don't fit, it's not a lack of talent. It's not a lack of ability. I don't even think it's a lack of coaching. But I think it's just, the, it's run its course at the Reds. Like, mm. Brad Fawn did as much as he could with them. And I think next step somewhere else for him. It's just my belief. And again, totally my belief. It's a, it's a Jurgen Klopp situation. You know, like, there's that thing where, like, Jurgen Klopp, at every, after every seven years, his team all of a sudden starts to struggle. I just feel yeah. like this has been the amount. They've had like five or so years under four, and he's done really well with them. Obviously struggled against the New Zealand teams, but it's just this, the, the time is now, and I think they're going to yeah. lose and lose badly. The Rebels. Now, the Rebels played in the last game over in Perth. Up 23-13, with, I think it was about 30 minutes to go, and I said, I don't even need to follow the updates anymore. They're going to win. I started gloating in my family group chat about the picks and how I picked the Rebels, how everyone else had picked the fourth, and the Rebels were going to come home strong and win this one. I start with egg on my face. The Rebels let me down. It's, it's not the end of the world, but it was a win I expected from this Rebels team. Yeah. Up 23-13, I expected the Rebels to, to finish the job. And the reason I expected them to finish the job is because I think the Rebels are better than they are. And I think they should be winning those games. They've got the team now to do it, and I'm bitterly disappointed. However, Jeremy Frost coming out of retirement to play for the Force, uh, it's not a bad story, I guess. Yeah. 
<laughs> makes me fucking angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we move on to Six Nations chat, my friend? I uh, just before we head off of Super Rugby, I just want to. Uh, take a look at uh, Super Round coming up this week because I think there's some really interesting games in there. So first game's Crusaders and Highlanders, and that's both teams need to do a bit of soul searching. So that'll be a good one to see the reality. Like, is this has the Crusaders myth been shattered, uh, or is it just, was it just a case of the Chiefs were too good? Rebels versus Hurricanes. You know, can the Hurricanes put up another amazing score? And you know, how real are the Rebels, and thus how real are the Force? Wana Pacifica versus the Chiefs. I think that one. Probably, I think the, the Saturday games should be relatively cut and dry. Chiefs versus Mana Pacifica, Waratahs versus the Dura. But again, it's your question of how good are the Dura um, and, and how good are the Waratahs this year. And last year, the Waratahs had big results against the Dura. Can they replicate? And also, Namani Nadolo facing his countrymen will be interesting as well. <laughs> he's an immense human being. You see him on the road, he's just bigger than everyone there. He makes everyone else there look like they're teenagers. Um, but Sunday is, for me, is where the great games are to be had. The first one, the Blues versus the Brumbies. I think this could be the match of the round. We we're just talking up both of these teams, and you especially with the Blues backline, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, at the Brumbies, you know, probably with the biggest chip on their shoulder this year with no one talking <laughs> about them, right? This is the team that's flying under everyone's radar, I think, and are looking to uh, be the upset kings. A and revenge the last game, game for them, surely, as well, after exactly, the last exactly. couple of weeks last year. Yep. Yeah. And then the Force versus uh, the Reds. Again, we'll learn more about these two teams. That one, for me, is probably the most interesting game of the round because we can see sort of how you put it before. How good are the Force or how poor are the Reds? Yeah, and especially that one, it'll be... Uh, I've got so many questions going into that one. Are you going to answer my questions or are you going to leave me asking more questions? I feel like that's that type of game. And it, it, the other thing with the Reds, and we talked about it a little bit, Taniela Tupo defecting to the Melbourne Rebels as well. It seems like it's all coming undone in Queensland. It does. And and I, I know we were just, obviously, we're going to move on to Super Rugby, uh, Super Rugby, Six Nations, guys. Hold on. Give us two seconds. I yeah. do want to shout out, um, obviously, Taniela Tupo, you just mentioned him, is injured, may not play another game for the Reds, um, but should be all right for the World Cup. Unfortunately, we witnessed the second nicest guy in rugby, Angus Bell. Hobble off the field and yeah. is reportedly out for four to six months with an injured toe. The one he did against England in yeah. the mid-year series last year. So that's terrible because Angus Bell, one of the second nicest guy, um, definitely putting his hand up for nicest guy. James Blackwell, yeah. watch yourself. That's all I'm saying. You you hold a lead at the moment, but if I was ranking you in niceness, if there's a niceness score out of 100, James Blackwell's a 99.8, Angus Bell's a 99.6. It's close. It yeah. really is. It's very close. Yeah, so, and yeah, yeah it looks like he's set to miss the entire Super Rugby season. But well, look, I, I will honestly take that if he's available for international season. I, as a Waratahs fan, I'm willing to make that sacrifice if he's back that's, for international that's season. That's a good man because I can tell you what, it changed the game when he came off for you guys. Yes. It was a noticeable difference. So, yes, but talking about international rugby, let's get on to the Six Nations, which I'm going to say the results went the way as expected. Yes. But it was another interesting round. Let's start. Yeah. Ireland beat Italy, however, not as convincing as many no. would have said. And Italy looked like they deserve a lot more than I think the one point that they're on. Let's 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 mention that they are yeah. showing that they've got some fight to them. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, versus France, they were they lost by five points. Versus England, they lost by seventeen points. Versus Ireland, they've lost by fourteen points. Right for a team that is that rarely wins any games in this competition and more often they're not blown out. They're starting to really uh, show some grit and determination. And I, you know, their colors are red, white, and green. They're not the worst red, white, and green team in the uh, six nations. Cause that <laughs> does belong to Wales at the moment. And yes. I think Italy is, uh, look, they play uh, Wales this week. Um, and next week I think they get a is, week off, but yes, oh, well, they do. Yeah. Uh, in the next round, there you go. You there got you go. it. In the next round. Uh, and I think that'll be a big one for Italian rugby. Talking about Wales, Wales obviously have gone through all their player um, strike talk. Yeah. We got, a, we got a game in the end. I mean, I, I'm not fully around the story, so we're not going to comment on it too much. Um, but we support the players because that's what we do. Um, yeah. But England do beat Wales. Not convincing yet again. Um, but... 
again, like we've said, England just have to tick boxes now if they're to win a um, mm-hmm. Six Nations title. They've just got to beat Ireland and France. Um, yep. And I think, especially the French, they can do it because the France, French, they beat Scotland. And, you know, should I give them a round of applause? Maybe. I'll, I'll you know. <laughs> However... It wasn't. It wasn't pretty, and I, I watched the replay actually uh, Sunday, and seven minutes in, they were up fourteen 0 and then they got a red card. The the uh, Scots, and I was like, oh god, here come the French are going to come for me. Uh, Scotland dominated that game. All right, I, I want to say it again. I gave you a little clap. It was a golf clap because yet again you haven't done anything to impress me. You won at home against Scotland, where there was two red cards in the game six minutes apart, so it didn't really ruin it. But Scotland dominated that game. Finn Russell had another fantastic game, and it was five points was the difference going into the last five minutes before uh, France, French, the French scored again. So all you've done is added Scotland to your you know home winning record, which isn't, isn't that impressive. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say it's the most impressive. Yes, they beat England. Yes, they beat what Wales, but they haven't beaten yeah. Ireland. They haven't beat it. They didn't beat New Zealand. They lost to Australia last year. So don't come out there saying it's impressive. You won a game, all right? You won a game you're expected to win. You win in his favourites. Yeah. You won. I'm not impressed. You didn't look good. You're going to lose to England, and then you'll eventually, you know, finish fourth in the Six Nations. And I'm just, I'm sticking to yeah. it. They're still fourth currently. Everyone laughed at us when we ranked them so low, but little did they know what we knew. Little did they know yep. what we knew. We knew that this French team was all talk. We knew it. And I'm standing up until they can move higher than fourth or third place. I'm coming at you, French, and I'll keep coming at you. And this will yep. go on our Instagram again, and you all comment about how much I talk shit about the French. But I'm going to keep doing it until you lose a World Cup. Look, the France are going to lose to England this week. England's going to beat Ireland next week as well. So it'll be doubly humiliating for them as well. So... Yeah, look, it's going to be just, it's going to be a bad time to be, be French and then, yeah, knocked out in the group stages in the World Cup, most likely. So, yeah. That's, I couldn't ask for much more. I couldn't ask for yeah, much lo- more. Yeah, lost, lost in the final of the World Cup of soccer last year. Uh, you know, poor showing in the Rugby League World Cup, poor showing in the Six Nations, poor showing in the World Cup. It's everything that a, uh, what would it be, a, a, fr- a Francophobe could want. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's the Six Nations. Uh, they've got, yeah, as we said, a week's break and then back again with some good games. Uh, yes. A few talking points just to finish us off. The Springboks, I read, want to hide, hire Nigel Owens ahead of the Rugby World Cup, a report has come out and said. Now, again. Very South African move. <laughs> I was... Took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, I was literally about to say, look, I'm never going to judge a team for trying to get, you know, do the best thing for their team. Yeah. And every team does this. It's just the most South African move to try and hire the best ref in Nigel Owens. Like, they've gone, hey, let's get Nigel, because if anyone did it as good as Nigel, we're still waiting for them, because there's no one as good as Nigel. So I just sit there and I go, that's the most South African thing is, not only are you going out to get a ref and it somehow become public knowledge in a news story, which every team would do. If, you, if yes. Eddie Jones hasn't got Angus Gardner in the refing group, New Zealand with uh, Dolman or um, whatever the other one's name is, they're, they're, they're silly. But it's the fact they've gone out and got Nigel Owens. Not a South African ref who mm. could you know, help out and do it. They've gone and got Nigel Owens. Interesting. But I just Very thought, interesting. You know, um. I just I wanted to quickly chat because I was I was interested as well that the locks and the locking situation in Super Rugby and particularly looking at our teams as the mm. Wallabies and the uh, All Blacks because look I saw a, a master performance from Brody Retallick. We obviously know Sam Whitelock's getting on, um, and they're probably our starting locks for the All Blacks. I looked around and I saw Nick Frost had an all right game. wasn't bad, wasn't good. Caden Neville didn't do anything special. Um, Jed Holloway, all right again. You know he's talented. And I just went, I can name a few names, but outside of that, there's not a lot. And I watched, rewatched the Hurricanes versus the Reds, as a good Hurricane supporter would do. And the Reds locks, I don't want to say they were atrocious, but they were atrocious. Um, yeah, you don't want to say, it, but you will say it because it's true. 
because it's the truth. And again, yeah. and if there's one thing we do on this podcast, it's the truth. It's the the truth. Yeah. I hate the French, and we're much like a bully. We don't pull our punches. <laughs> But I don't want to. I don't want to bully these guys either. I just want to say they were atrocious on this night. They may come back, but I just the locking the locking um, stock in New Zealand and Australia has me a little bit worried. Yeah. I just when I compare it to the Northern Hemisphere, our South African Southern Hemisphere brothers that cheated on us sometimes, I tend to look and I go, we're not as good as them in the locking department. Like yeah. without. Brody Retallick having a stellar season. There's not a lock I would probably put up to like a Mario J, a um, Evan Etzebeth, uh, yeah. and there's there's even James Ryan and Todd Burney from Ireland now. And that's I think oh, what I'm noticing. Even the French, you know, they've got some some locks on firing on all cylinders at the moment when they're not getting recarded. I, I look around and I go, when the best teams in the world are doing something right, you tend to want to copy that you know rugby is a copycat league of if you yeah. can do something and get away with it and and you can copy someone you try to and the lo- best team in the world ireland have two of the better locks if not two of the best locks in the world that you can make that argument and i just i looked around and i wasn't too impressed i, I don't know what's your opinion on that my friend i am very worried about the australian uh locking situation i mean look what's what's concerning is that there is good australian locks but they're just not in australia <laughs> and there's no relaxing of the Giddo law, uh, at least at this stage, that we've heard about. Uh, and it's that's what's concerning. You know, you've got Will Skelton, uh, Rory Arnold um, overseas. Uh, I'd love to see Skelton back in Wallabies colours for the World Cup, but I don't think there's a spot for him. You know, there's Karevi, there's Corabetti, and then probably Quaid will be needed, right? Uh, there's, yeah, it, 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 so with three three spots... You know, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I hate the ghetto law for this reason. You know, we're just hamstrung in in, in a one particular position, but you've got three amazing players that can't be, that you, you can't not have them in the squad. I've changed my tune slightly on the ghetto law, and I'm not going full balls to the other side where we shouldn't abolish it. Like, yeah. the Welsh team in the Welsh structure, they're like, it's, it's just very similar, but there's no numbers, so it's like, as long as you've played, and again, I may be wrong, but I, this is what I picked up from the article I read. It's like 60 caps, which I think is the same, or like five years playing in Wales, and then you can sign a contract overseas, and then if you play, you can come back and play for Wales. Any number. And I actually like that idea, you know, where it's not, hey, only free players. It's you've got to do this certain amount. So I think in Australia it's 60 caps or five years in Super Rugby. I yeah. think that's that's the qualifying. I think it's good. And yep. I think that's that's the way to go about it. You've got to do your yeah. time in Super Rugby yes. and go five years in Super Rugby and 60 caps or 50 caps. It doesn't even need to be caps. As long as you play at least five years in Super Rugby, you qualify. And if you go overseas, you can still be selected and there should be any number. Because we still got to at least, yeah, like I saw the article come out why uh, the CEO, who, again, your CEO has been fantastic, was against taking away the rule and it was because he had made this pledge to New Zealand rugby that they were going to focus on super rugby it was going to be the competition they were going to that was they were going to push that and everything and I was like I again as, as critical yeah. as we've been of the ghetto law I haven't taken that fully into account about yeah you do have to still make it that but you can do that while letting players go it's just well. too harsh and I think we, there's, there's you know I think we've always seen a space for something similar Right I, to the ghetto law, like I think we said that yes, Super Rugby does need to be a good product, and we need to have something that makes players want to stay in Super Rugby. Um, but it's just too strict at the moment for a limit of three players. It's just too strict with how much great Australian talent there is out there, uh, and you could do that while still making Super Rugby a great, um, a great product to watch i think you can do both and i think it's the pendulum is just too far in one direction at the moment it's too conservative ease up a little bit and look here's the thing as well i don't think we've said and maybe i'm wrong maybe we have called for the law to be abolished i probably have in a fit of passion but yeah. look ease up on, <laughs> ease up on the gas a little bit see what happens you know take it gradually you don't need to just abolish the law straight up just relax it a little bit see how that works out and then if you need to recalibrate from there or ease it even further because 
at the end of the day, the goal should be to win a World Cup. It should be to get your country to win a World Cup. Um, and yeah, that, that's especially this year, that's what the focus should be. Like, I know there is the commitment to Super Rugby, but I think that has to play second fiddle to winning a World Cup. And uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's not who's going to complain that the that they've changed it just for a World Cup year or not? Like, who's mm. really who is that upsetting really? I don't. Well, know. I, I imagine the lock that misses out on playing in a World Cup because you brought Will Skelton back will probably be one of the few complaining. Well, yeah. Look, I mean, and <laughs> get better, son. It's, just it's, be it's probably, better. All right. Yeah, he's probably tall enough to be noticed as well. But it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, he can take his complaint to Will Skelton. <laughs> Steve I, is complaining then. It is interesting because this is becoming a hot topic in New Zealand if we end up with the bear Omoanga law. Um, because we see this every every four years as an exodus of all black talent. Um, I'm still iffy on it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we don't have it yet. Uh, but it'll take a player like a, a Vrico Oani where there was talks about him signing overseas. I was about to be like, oh, fuck, we, we've got the Oani law. It's going to be the yep. ironing law because no way we want to lose a 26-year-old at the peak top two free centres in the world to not being able to play with the All Blacks just because he's gone overseas. Now, he could do a sabbatical yep. and everything, but, yeah, it'll be interesting. Interesting times ahead. What I wanted to finish on was the new law's uh, verdict. Just a bit of, uh, I guess, review. There was new laws put in place, the shot clocks, all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, a new one that I even learned about until uh, I went and played uh, into a footy camp this week, last weekend, uh, was the number nine at the back of the scrum. So now, no longer can the number nine go past the gate. You know how the number nine yeah. used to always go past the gate. And fuck it, if a scrum wasn't messy enough, they were going to make it messier. Um, they're actually not allowed to go past that 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 you know where they deliver the ball and yeah. channel the defending nine. So they there's going to be a lot more defence coming from the yeah. back of the scrum. I am all uh, A++ is my verdict for the new rules, I think. There was even yep. moments in that Waratahs-Brumbies game where I was like, they could go further. Like yep. There was a couple of moments where it was slowed down a little bit by a Brumbies or two player taking a knee. And the ref, to the ref's credit in that game, he went over and tapped him on the shoulder, said, Nate, you've got to get off the field. But yep. there was there was some times where I was like, we can go even faster, and I don't think it's a, a risk to play was- too much. It was definitely a much easier product to watch. I'll say oh, that it was 100%. easier to watch. Yeah, and uh, look, we you know we were there, there at the stadium. There were a lot of our like people that don't usually watch rugby. Like I think behind us were a couple of very loud league fans who <laughs> thought they were the funniest people in the world, um, and they were still uh, having a good time uh, because there wasn't a whole heap of delays, right? So you know that's that's what's great. You know. Uh, I think that that speaks to the positivity of the new rules, and there wasn't like a rash of super bad injuries that you could say, "Oh, these rules because they're speeding everything up, more players are getting injured." Yeah, uh, I mean, totally it's the agree. first game, but I think the the first the appetizer to the season has gone down very well. Yeah, and I mean that my my point before of the sixty odd points per game, if we they keep delivering attacking rugby like that, I think world rugby will take notice, and a lot of a lot of other sports yeah. will kind of take notice. Other sports and no, 100%. Rugby league, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Super Rugby Round, Super Round coming up. Uh, that'll be exciting. Um, maybe next year we'll end up doing some coverage from there. You never know with our newfound uh, talent and yep. our, you know, challenge that we've put down to Stan. Um, so, yeah. Anything else you want to... You want to get off your chest, my friend? It's you know you obviously lost on the weekend. I won, so I'll let you have the final word. Oh, look, yeah. Even though we lost, I'm actually not that upset by it, which I'm surprised at. You know, um, I think a lot of people underrated the Brumbies. I think even I underrate the Brumbies a bit, um, and I think they played a fantastic game. And it's exciting to see potentially two good quality Aussie teams that should make the top eight. Uh, so yeah, look. Even then, I, I think you know it's upsetting about Angus Bell being lost, and that severely dents the Waratahs' chances at uh, winning a title this year. But look, for me, this year it's less about the Waratahs, more about the Wallabies. And even though I've picked the Waratahs to win the competition, you know that's that's just my that's my faith speaking there. 
but I would honestly trade a Waratahs title for a great showing by the Wallabies at the World Cup. So for me, all signs are focused towards the World Cup this year. There we go. That's well, all I'm fa- channeling this year. That's all Hughesy's channeling. All we're channeling is wrapping this show up. Uh, thank you for joining us. We will be back again next week in some capacity. We'll find a way when there's a will. There is a way. We'll see you there. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Peace.